This is a part two to the video I made about putting Linux on an Atari VCS and kind of using it as a Linux computer. Um, nobody asked for this video, but for one thing, I'm kind of working on my camera work a little bit. There were some things, some commentary that kind of got cut out of that first video, but if you haven't watched it, that's where I kind of show proof of concept of kind of converting an Atari VCS to a pure kind of Linux Ubuntu machine. So if you haven't seen that video, um, watch that one first. Um, here I'm gonna just talk about some things I didn't get to talk about and maybe go off on a couple little rants. So I know if I would have watched that first video of putting Linux on the Atari VCS and then just installing Steam at the end and then kind of downloading Steam games on the Atari VCS, one question I would have um, is, hey, that's not cool. Like you just blew away the purpose of the Atari and um, now you're going to just put Steam games on. Um, so one thing that kind of got cut out from that video is the first system I did buy is the Black Walnut Bundle. So this came with the console and then one modern controller and one classic controller. So I have that set up in another room and yeah, I'm using this as a pure Atari system. I did add a 250 gig um, M.2 SSD um, for Atari games. And then I watched some of your guys' videos on the best Atari VCS games and I spent like about a hundred bucks on all that. So um, yeah, I do have a pure Atari system and that's kind of in another room and stuff and I was really happy with that. So the idea for the other project was to just get the base system, which I paid $200 for, um, and this was the 800 Onyx. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to turn this into a complete like Linux computer? So first thing I want to say about the, the new Atari VCS is that I think the approach that Atari took was pretty reasonable. Like they used, um, not off the shelf, but you know, standard commodity hardware from AMD that would be compatible with Linux. And then that way they could use Linux as their under the hood OS. And then on top of that, build the storefront. And then it's a just standard business model where they want to sell the hardware, but then also have a storefront so that they're making money from the software as well. So in this digital age, that's pretty common. I think that was a good approach, sensible. Um, you know, I would have loved it if they would have done custom Atari hardware, um, you know, just unique to Atari, custom chips, and then even maybe used cartridges for like the retro filling with custom Atari games. But you know, that's, that's kind of asking a lot. Um, that would be like going back to something like the Atari Jaguar. And um, so the problem with that is it's asking a lot of developers for somebody to like take six months out of their life to learn this specific hardware, to really dedicate a whole team or a whole small company to targeting games for it. And um, it's pretty risky for like a, a game developments company to do that, especially now that we're in the era of like Sony PlayStation 5, um, Xbox. So you're competing with these giants. So that would have been pretty crazy. I would have loved it. I would have supported it. And you know, I would have been buying, collecting all the cartridges and stuff. And um, so that kind of gets me back to the Atari Jaguar because I was a huge fan of the Atari Jaguar and that was the approach that they took, Atari at the time, took for the Atari Jaguar. They go, we're gonna make like real Atari hardware, custom, custom games, you know, we're gonna sign on developers, license stuff. Um, and so one kind of going off on a Jaguar rant is that now when you um, watch videos um, and reviews on YouTube about the Jaguar, the story is that it was like a failed system and um, it was like one of the worst game consoles ever and all that. And I want to tell you, as being a person that was there at the time, um, that is not the right story. That's kind of like revisionist history because people are, um, to be honest, they're, they're sometimes getting the timeline wrong. So like at the time the Atari Jaguar came out, um, 
the Super Nintendo was out and the Sega Genesis was out. So it was competing with the 16-bit, um, for the most part, um, like 2D um, game systems, you know, that they were still using 16-bit, you know, a lot of sprites and um, a lot of 2D gameplay. And that's what really what the Jaguar was competing when it came out. And I remember getting the Jaguar and it was really exciting because of the hardware. Like it was all custom hardware. Like they had new new RISC chips. Um, I was a computer science major at the time. So like that kind of stuff interested me. So there's basically like two custom 32-bit chips. There was um, a graphics chip and then there was a DSP for sound. And um, then you had also just a Motorola 68000 which was kind of to like help handle the controllers and um, kind of other general purpose, purpose um, computation. And so it was kind of cool knowing that, okay, this thing is custom hardware. And I remember the very first game that came out was Cybermorph that came with the system. And um, Good it was definitely 3D. I mean, this was like early 3D, um, really polygonal and kind of simple shading and stuff, but it was true 3D Good running on the work. hardware. Um, and so when you played it, it was a little bit quirky, like Cybermorph didn't ha really have a good soundtrack. And um, Where did you it was like, it was almost felt like a tech demo, but you definitely felt like, okay, this thing is way more powerful than like a Super Nintendo. And then just an absolute home run, like killer app was Tempest 2000. Um, by Jeff Minter and I still think this is one of the greatest like console games ever like Tempest 2000 on Atari Jaguar should be in some type of console game Hall of Fame if such a thing exists so um, this is a killer game and it is on the Atari 50th celebration so you can you can play it um, I don't know an emulation it looks the colors at least on my TV don't look as good as the original um, but other than that, this you can get a taste of for what it was at the time, but this thing was just amazing. And there was also other games like um, um, Iron Soldier was a great 3D game. This was like a mech game. And um, basically it was just, you could tell that like neither the Sega Genesis nor Super Nintendo could possibly do something like this. I think the Super Nintendo later came out with Star Fox, which kind of had similar polygonal 3D, but it was, they I think they had to add hardware to the cartridge. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. And then, um, uh, you know, another exciting thing that happened with the Jaguars when they ported Doom over to a console and playing Doom, which is, you know, an early FPS um, on a console was, was pretty awesome. And I remember this was like $69 back then, but it was, it was like, you felt like it was worth it. And there was a lot of other really good games, like um, Raiden for the Jaguar was really good. Um, Rayman was another awesome game. And some of these, like let's say the Jaguar would have been paired at the very beginning with something like Rayman. I think it would have been like a killer system. Um, I think it would have sold way more when you saw it got to games like this. The whole problem is it took too long to get to really good games like this. And in between there were some duds. And if you read the Wikipedia page on the Jaguar, apparently what happened was some developers felt like there was such a learning curve for the um, for the custom graphics and sound chips that they took a shortcut and they ended up just writing code to run on the Motorola 68K. So, you know, they'd port another game and um, maybe it was already on the Nintendo and they'd port it just using the 68K on the Jaguar. So that was kind of um, led a little bit to the demise because then you had these like 16-bit kind of duds in there. And then also just the, you know, a lot of this has to do with timing. Like some of the stuff just took too long um, to come out and they kind of lost momentum. And then um, eventually you had the Sony PlayStation 1 coming out and then kind of doing everything better. Um, and you know, Sony is just a huge company, so they're able to pretty much crush, put that was like the final nail in the coffin for the Jaguar. But I just wanna, this little rant, I just wanna say at the time, 
it wasn't like the Sony existed yet. Sometimes you'll see videos like that where the, the timeline's messed up and it wasn't like that. It was an exciting system when it came out. There's a lot of optimism, you know, um, there was like diehard people that loved it and um, there were some great games on it. So there was at least, I was probably playing the Jaguar maybe up until like 1998 or something. So another thing you might ask is like, why should I spend $200 on an Atari VCS to put Linux on it when there's all these other mini PCs? So yeah, that's a valid point. I mean, I have something like this, um, probably about 200. This is running um, Intel hardware. And this is actually running Ubuntu and it's running really well. I think it's got four gigs of RAM, um, some type of like Celeron based chip. Um, it came with Windows 11, but I blew it away and put Linux. And this thing is actually running exceptionally well. I was surprised. Um, and this just has a direct HDMI. Um, you can plug this directly into an HDMI port. Um, so yeah, there's always something like this. This is a lot smaller, uh, maybe like $20 cheaper, I forget. So you, you ask, well, why should I spend 200 for a project like this? Well, for one thing, um, this is a little bit more upgradable than some of those. So like this, in the other video, I upgraded this to 32 gigs of RAM and one terabyte SSD, which 30, Linux on 32 gigs um, is pretty powerful. And believe me, this blows away uh, especially after upgrades, this blows away a Raspberry Pi. Um, of course, Raspberry Pi, you might want to do projects with it with the GPIO pins, but um, but you know this like for a while you can be fooled with Ubuntu on like a Raspberry Pi four, where it feels like hey this is like a a Linux desktop in this tiny form factor, but then um, there are things when you kind of like start multitasking and stuff and. Um, bringing up a bunch of stuff for it'll it'll start freezing and you'll kind of you'll kind of get the idea oh yeah I forgot this is a Raspberry Pi running on ARM hardware so from a hardware perspective this thing um, AMD 1606G Ryzen kind of blows away more of a single board computer and then the other thing is just the personality like um, you know it's got a nice form factor cool design you got the Atari logo that lights up. Um, in the video, you can see um, when I take it apart, the motherboard also has a cool um, Atari logo on it. And there's even kind of a little Easter egg where on the printed on the uh, motherboard are little like Space Invaders. So it's just stuff like that um, that just kind of gives it more personality. And just I think for me to have this running, like let's say I find a specific purpose for it, like in four years just have it on the shelf like hey what's that Atari hardware doing it's just gonna be like cool there's just a coolness factor with it anyway that's about it some of those were kind of dinosaur old man rants but um, that was basically about it the Atari is always exciting anytime there's new Atari hardware in the whole Atari ecosystem is really exciting so I think the Atari VCS is cool I hope everyone kind of starts um, enjoying the stuff on the store, but also maybe playing with the PC mode at the very least. And then maybe we'll get this community of, of kind of other games developing. Okay, guys, that's about it. Um, that's all I have. This was just a little bit of a sec second part rant session and um, probably do another video of something totally different. But like I said, Atari is always fun and interesting to talk about.